I want us to turn our attention to the Word of God. But before we get into that, let's open up in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for this opportunity um, that you have given us to come together to worship you, to celebrate amazing events for the kids, uh, but also to hear from your word. We pray that you will convict us, that you will guide us, that you will help us to focus, and that you'll encourage us in this time. I pray that you will give me the words to say and that you'll give all of us the ears to hear and the heart to understand what you want us to leave this room with. Pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so one thing that if you guys have been in history classes throughout high school and maybe even in college and maybe even before, you've heard of World War II, right? Yeah, so World War II, huge, it, looking back on it now, it almost seems like stuff from the movies, but it actually happened, and it's pretty horrific to look at what was going on. And one of the first instances where America was involved, our nation was involved, was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And as we look back, we can see that as a tragic moment in our nation's history where an opposing nation came in and destroyed a lot of our equipment, even when we weren't directly participating at that point. Now, it might be tempting to think that we lost that battle, and in all odds, we did. But after that, America went and we fought the war. We fought back the nation that had bombed us and ended up winning the war and honestly stopping um, the Holocaust and a lot of the terrible things that were happening with that. Now, as we look back, a phrase that I want us to think about is losing the battle but winning the war. Or even its inverse, winning the battle but losing the war. Because that's what happened with Japan. They won the Battle of Pearl Harbor and then they lost the war in general. And we'll see that principle coming out as we look and continue in our series through Habakkuk. We call this series Even If, because as we talked about last week, we see doubts and we see evil all around our world. And how do we respond even if everything seems to go wrong? So I want us to keep that in mind as we look at Habakkuk chapter 2, starting in verse 2. And before we get into that, it might help for a little bit of background, right? Because I know not everyone was here last week, and even if you were, you might have forgotten some things. I know I need the reminder personally myself as well. So Habakkuk chapter 1 starts off with the prophet Habakkuk noticing that his nation is wicked, that there's injustice and evil everywhere. So he cries out to God, God, when will you fix this? To which God responds, oh, don't worry, I'm raising up the Babylonians to destroy um, the nation of Israel, and then all the evil in Israel will be gone because the nation will be gone. To which Habakkuk responds, what? That, that's not what I asked for. Why are you doing this, God? You're perfect. Why are you using enemy nations to do your will? And that is where we pick off. We pick off with God's response. It says in Habakkuk 2, verse 2, and by the way, if you are using the Pew Bibles, the Bibles that we have underneath the chairs in front of you, this is on page 939. Verse 2 says, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks to the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness or by faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. So let's pause there and look at what we are talking about. So after Habakkuk's complaint to God, saying, God, there's wickedness in the nation of Israel, and God responding, okay, I'm sending Babylon to punish the wickedness in the nation of Israel, and Habakkuk responding, well, Babylon's even worse. Why are you doing that? God responds saying, I'm going to give you a prophecy. Write it down. Write it, make it plain, make it easy to understand. He says, write it, 
write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. And that phrase right there, a herald may run with it. I want us to be thinking not just a herald, right? The, the word actually means just anyone who reads. So it is saying that anyone who reads this message will proclaim it to those around them. He's saying, I'm going to give you a message to give to the nation. And anyone who reads it, well, they'll have to share it with those who, that, those who they are close with. Now, what exactly is this message about? Verse 3 says, the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end. And it will not prove false. So linger, wait for it. It will certainly come. This prophecy, this message that God is sending to the nation of Israel, he says, you might think that it is delayed, but it will come. And by the way, it speaks of the end. Now, there is a lot of debate on the topic of the prophecy speaking of the end. A lot of people think that the word speak there actually is talking about hastens or desires the end, that the prophecy will come quick and it will not stop. It will not rest until it comes true. And there's definitely truth to that. And the word used for speaks can actually really mean that. And we see throughout, right? It says it awaits an appointed time. If it linger, it will certainly come and will not delay. That it does desire for its end. But it also speaks of the end. Now, what is this end that it is speaking of? Some people have theorized that it is speaking of the end times, right? When Jesus comes back, when all that is wrong will be made right. Some people think that this is talking about when will Israel end or when will Babylon be destroyed, as we will see in the future. And we're left asking which one is correct. And my thought is yes, they both are. Now, I don't know about you guys, but um, when you go to a mountain range and you look out and you see all these mountains, right? They look kind of like they are all in one line. But if you think about it and you travel to them, you'll notice, okay, this mountain is maybe a half hour drive from where I'm at now. But that mountain over there, that's like a five hour drive just to get to it. Driving through Monument Valley or those other places throughout the Southwest, you can see this happening a lot, right? Kind of as we're tying back into our VBS theme. And that is oftentimes the same way as prophecy in the Bible. Where God will have a message that we think is speaking about one thing, but it is actually speaking about multiple. Isaiah chapter 6 promises a coming Savior, and that Savior is very specifically described as someone in that day and age. But then Matthew actually interprets it as talking about Jesus saving the world. And again, which one is correct? Yes, both of them are. So I believe as we look through this that when it says that it will speak of the end— Kind of as we look at the mountain range and we think it's one line, but it's actually two different mountains very far apart, that we are talking about two different fulfillments. A primary one where this prophecy will happen and we'll be talking about what is going to be happening very quickly. And a further fulfillment when it will be fully completed, when it will ring fully true. So this revelation is to be spread among the people. It will come soon, even if it seems like it is taking a while. Just, just wait, it's coming very quickly. But what exactly is this message about? Verse 4, this will be kind of our theme for the entire day. God says, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright or not righteous, but the righteous person will live by faith. And it says faithfulness in the NIV, but you'll notice at the bottom, if you're using the Pew Bible, it says this word also means faith. And in the original languages, that word is faith, but it can also mean faithfulness. We see in the New Testament people quoting this passage and just saying, the righteous will live by faith. So what is this saying? The enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. We can liken that to Babylon, who is coming to destroy Israel. They are not upright. They are not righteous. Their desires are for themselves. 
but the righteous shall live by faith. Even if everything is going wrong, how are the righteous to live? By faith. In a way, God is saying, trust me. Trust him. Even if we don't understand what is going on, our position towards God, our stance towards God should be one of, I don't know what you're doing, God, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to see what you're doing. God says the righteous, those who are upright, those who are in good standing with God will live by their faith. Now, just to kind of clarify this, faith is kind of a Bible word, right? Um, it is what some have called Christianese, a word that is said so much in the church that people outside the church don't really know, and people inside the church have kind of lost all sense of its meaning. What exactly is faith? I, I'm willing to bet that if most people tried to define it, they wouldn't really come up with a solid answer in their minds. I know that for me, it is really hard to define faith. But if we look even in the book of Hebrews, it says in Hebrews 11, faith is the evidence of things not seen. It is the conviction of things hoped for. In a way, faith is believing in something that you do not see. It is believing that, you know, although I cannot see the outside, I trust that it is sunny. Now, that might be wrong because we live on the southern Oregon coast, right? But faith is believing in something that you do not see. So we should live by faith. And even if we don't see God's plan, we still believe that he has a plan. Then he continues in verse 5 saying, Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. The end of this intro, God likens the wicked, the evil, the, um, the proud, the arrogant to wine. And other translations actually state that wine is a traitor that it puts the alcohol actually in the negative and likens these two even closer than the NIV states. But make no mistake, it's talking about the arrogant person. We know what happens when you drink a little bit too much alcohol, right? You start to lose judgment. You desire more. There's a reason why a lot of people can't just stop at one or two or three or five drinks, right? It is because wine is greedy, it is never satisfied, and much like that, the evil person, the wicked person, is the same. Much like Babylon, as we talked about last week, will come to punish the nation of Israel, they will also punish a little bit too much. That They will go on, they will not be satisfied just destroying the nation of Israel, but they'll have to go on and destroy Assyria and fight against Egypt and go against all these other nations and Persia and fill in the blank because they are never satisfied. Wine betrays him. He's arrogant and never at rest. And this is where we get to the meat of our passage. Because Habakkuk's complaint to God saying, why are you letting the some more evil than us destroy us? God's response is, trust me, I have this handled because the greedy, the unrighteous, the wicked people, their time is coming. It's interesting in the book of Daniel, we see actually the story of Babylon. And they come and they destroy Israel, just like God had promised. They take captive all the young and the wealthy and the well-off people to train up and kind of use as their own. Trying to assimilate them into the nations and all the others, well, you're just going to be either dead or farmers, right? You're going to take care of the land. And Israel was destroyed in that time. But God was still working. He brought up a man named Daniel, hence the book of Daniel, to come and to share his word, to proclaim the will of God to his people. I bookmarked this, but I can't find it. Oh, there it is. And we see an interesting passage in Daniel chapter 5. You see, God was working, but Babylon was arrogant. The king of Babylon, Belshazzar, fun name, right? 
By the way, if you want to name your children something interesting, just look in the Bible. It can be pretty entertaining. You might get the name Blastus, or you might get the name Mahalalel. So it goes both ways. Um, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, is greedy, and he is desiring more, just like Habakkuk prophesies. So he decides to throw a giant party. And in this party, him and all of his royal subjects and, you know, all the leadership of the nation, they're getting massively drunk. So much that they can't really tell what is going on. And in his drunkenness, the king cries out, hey, you know, Israel, that land that we conquered, remember their temple, how we... um, how he stole all of the sacred things from there. Why don't we bring out those gold cups and use that to get drunk with? Now, how do you think God would feel about that? Probably not good. Well, definitely not good because the Bible conveys in Daniel chapter 5 that a hand appears out of nowhere, just floating, and it writes four words on a wall. And this is kind of horrific. Think about it. This hand, if it is separate from a body, is probably a little bit gory, right? It's not clean. It's not an animated cartoon. This would horrify you, especially if you were pretty drunk like these people were. So they call for Daniel, a prophet of God, to come and interpret it. So he comes and he starts to share with the king, King Belshazzar, all of this plan, condemning him for what he has done. And we pick up in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 5. The writing that was written that no one could read, Daniel says, this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, parsin. Here's what these words mean. Mini means God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom, which, by the way, that's a little weird, right? Daniel just prophesied their demise, and then he's uh, honored. It's because, well, they weren't able to interpret what it said. So what happens with this prophecy? Well, good news, verse 30 and 31 tells us exactly what happens, right? That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. God prophesied, hey, because you are doing these wicked things, because you are defacing the sacred um, elements of the temple, because you are, in a way, being betrayed by wine, as Habakkuk says, their kingdom is coming to a close. And that very night, they don't have to wait long until God's justice happens. This prophecy in Habakkuk, as we go back to Habakkuk chapter 2, is talking about a similar thing. That the wicked, they may think that they are good to go. They may think that they have it all handled, but their time is coming too. Habakkuk complains to God, what are you going to do about Babylon? And God says, trust me. Wait, I've got it handled. Verse 6 of Habakkuk chapter 2 says, Will not all of them, that is the nations who are being conquered, taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, and you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. So what is God's response? To Babylon, he starts to lay out five woes. Now, these woes aren't like, whoa, that's cool, right? No, they are beware of what is going on. Woe is a bad thing. It is a warning of something terrible that is going to happen. So God provides five woes. He says that the plunderer will be plundered that the fortified will be torn down, that the violent, what is my word there? Yet the violent will be vanity. The shame will be shamed in and of themselves and the idols will be silent. 
So he says, first off, woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? He's talking about a nation that comes and they get their wealth from robbing other people. And we can see this even beyond the national scale, but people here, maybe even in our community in Habakkuk's day, who misuse other people and who take advantage of them, who pile up stolen goods and makes themselves wealthy by extortion. So what is going to happen to these people who come and they steal in order to make themselves wealthy, who destroy in order to build up their own fortune? It says, because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. There is a consequence to this. Those who do wicked, who get unjust gain for themselves, will themselves be plundered in the future. Remember our intro? We talked about winning the battle, but losing the war. That's what's going to happen with the wicked. You see, it may look like they are taking advantage. It may look like they are ahead, that they are winning, but they will lose in the long run. The Bible says, because God is just. It may look like the people who are plundering and building up wealth for themselves at the expense of others are going to get away with it, but they will not. Because God wins the war, even if it seems like this battle is being lost. And I want to mention also, as we go through these woes, it is oftentimes a temptation to think or to hear in sermons that, oh, all these negative passages, they're talking about me, right? And yeah, some of them are. We need to make sure that we're not ripping other people off, right? But other times, it's meant to comfort. Because I don't know you guys, I don't know if you've been taken advantage of. And hearing that, you know, God's justice will happen is a comfort. Because there are wicked people in this world. And although we can do wicked things ourselves, God will protect those who are being taken advantage of, especially if it's you. So he says to the wicked, beware those who plunder, because you yourselves will be plundered, since you have destroyed others. The next woe. We see, woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones will, of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. In a way, he is saying that the fortified cities will be torn down. That those who think they are building up great things for themselves, Right? that it will be dismantled. The wicked, they do things and they build up the security for themselves to keep themselves protected. And God says, that won't work. You can't escape God's justice by building a giant wall around yourself. You can't escape God's justice by sending all your funds overseas. You can't escape God's justice by hiding away or diminishing those who you have taken advantage of. God says here, woe to him who builds his house, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin because they have done evil. And God says, you will forfeit your life. Those who, after they do wicked, try to hide themselves away to protect themselves cannot escape God's judgment because the fortified will be dismantled. And it's interesting here in verse 9, it says, The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. In a way, it's saying even the buildings itself will cry out for justice. A wicked person may go and try to hide from God and even the building that they are hiding in will say, Hey, you're not getting away from him. God's justice is coming. And maybe you guys have felt that in your lives. Someone did something to you and you feel like, Oh, they are getting away with it. They have hidden away. They have built up a system that encourages them and that keeps them from blame. God won't let them get away with it. He is promising to make things right, even if it seems like things are wrong in the moment. They will happen. God will bring about justice. So he talked about the plunderers being plundered, right? In the first woe. The second woe was talking about the fortified being dismantled. And the third one 
is that violence will be in vain. Verse 12 says, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice, verse 12 says. That violence done in order to build your experience, to build your influence, it happens, right? Maybe some of you have experienced that as well. Not just goods being taken by the wicked, not just them setting themselves up to protect themselves, but just straight up violence happening in order to build their influence. And God says in verse 13, has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire and the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Now, when I read this, I thought, well, that can't, that's going to be the opposite, right? That God hasn't determined that all the stuff we do is in vain. But that's not what it says. It says God has determined that what the wicked in particular do in order to build up their authority and their, their influence, that it's only going to be fuel for the fire. That it will fall apart. Their, their attempts to grab at power will fall to the ground because God won't let them get away with it forever. That their labor, their violence is only fuel for the fire of God's justice. That they exhaust themselves and it turns out to be for nothing because all the influence they had built up falls away. Now in practical terms, right, looking at battles and wars and nations, if a nation comes in and destroys another nation, right, they get these cities based off of bloodshed. But what happens when the next nation comes and destroys the cities that they have captured? It's meaningless for them. The violence done by the wicked for the wicked will be meaningless. The good that they think they have gained from their violence will turn into nothing. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. And all this is done, it says in verse 14, so that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I love that image. How much do the waters cover the sea? Completely, right? Yeah, there is no sea without the waters. Literally, it's saying one thing is the other thing. How much do the waters cover the sea? Entirely because there is no sea without the waters. The earth, because of God's justice brought on evil, will be filled with the knowledge of God completely. And we can see that happening as Babylon is destroyed and these prophecies have come fulfilled from the prophet Daniel. And the prophet Habakkuk, right? But we also see it that will happen in the future. When God makes everything right for good. Because the wicked who have plundered will be plundered by God. Those who think that they have built up for themselves a stronghold. When Jesus comes back, that will be laid waste. Those who create violence in order to build their authority when their violence is turned into nothing because Jesus is coming to establish a perfect kingdom, everyone will know that Jesus is Lord. Remember the mountains. We can look and we can think that's the prophecies are just all talking about one thing. But it can be expanded to more. We don't just see it coming true in the nation of Babylon being destroyed after destroying many other nations. We see it about to come true when Jesus comes back and will set everything right. Verse 15 says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it on the wineskin, pouring it from the wineskin until they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood, and you have destroyed 
lands and cities and everyone in them. God says that the shamers will be shamed. Those who have forced others into disgrace by forcing them to get drunk and then staring at their nakedness. Now, that could be very well talking at face value about literally getting someone drunk and staring at their nakedness, right? Or it could just be talking about shame in general because nations, when they took over another nation, they had to completely demoralize them. And the story of King David's life, one of his armies went out to war, lost, got captured, and then his army got sent back naked. That's something that enemies did in that time. They would shame the people that they had conquered in order to show, hey, we have truly won. Not just the actual victory, but the moral victory as well. In the story of David, he provides them with clothes and covers up their shame. But in here, Habakkuk promises not just that we will be covered when we are shamed, but that those who have brought shame on others will themselves be shamed. And we might not see it. It might happen in days to come. It might happen when Jesus comes back. But the shame that others have wrought on their victims will be brought back on themselves. God will not let the wicked go unpunished. They think they have won the battle, but they have lost the war because God is truly in charge. Verse 18, as we continue on this last woe, says, of what value is an idol carved by craftsmen or what image that make that teachers lie For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Our passage ends. It says, of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? And this is a theme throughout the Bible where God will make fun of idols, these false gods that people worship, right? Because, well, think about it. Can wood speak? No, right? Can a a stone teach? No, and yet people will build these statues way back in the Bible days and even in some places now in the world and expect that to guide them and teach them when they have created it themselves. It's kind of crazy if, let's say God created humanity and said, okay, humans, I'm going to worship you. No, that's entirely backwards, right? And yet people who build these idols, these statues, they say, hey, you know what? I need guidance. So block of wood that I cut a face into. Can you teach? And what does it say? Exactly. Nothing. It cannot teach. It cannot save. It cannot guide. And God responds at the end saying, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The idols that people make and that they build up and they worship, they are silent. But God says, no, I speak and I am the one who has the authority to speak alone. That we are to stand before God knowing that he is in control, knowing that he is all-powerful, that he can do what he wants, that he will punish wickedness. Now, with this last topic about idols, we might think, oh, well, I don't have a statue to Zeus in my house, right? So I'm good. I don't have to worry about that. But we all have pedestals in our house, I'm assuming, that has something that we might worship on it. A TV, right? Right? Can that teach? Well, if it has electricity running through it, then it can convey what other people have said. But the TV itself can't teach, right? It's silent. Why do we spend so much time in front of it? Maybe there's a relationship that you have put up on a pedestal too high, right? That can be an idol. What if it's wealth? Money cannot teach you. Money cannot guide you. It actually is a root of a lot of different kinds of evil, And yet we oftentimes make an idol out of it. Sometimes even 
as I'm standing up here in a sports jersey, we can make sports an idol, right? And we hate other people because they like a sports team. Yeah, there are teams I don't like, but, you know, it's a game. I'm not called to actually hate the people, right? We might root against the team, but people oftentimes take that and make it an idol. They'll give their entire weekends avoiding church to watch sports games or to play in sports games, right? So what idols do you have? Because I can guarantee you they're not going to teach you. They're not going to guide you. They are silent when God himself is the one who has authority to speak into your lives. And to those who worship idols, their foolishness is evident. And God says, you're worshiping the wrong thing. It's amazing in this passage, Habakkuk's complaint to God saying, there's so much evil in our nation what are you going to do about it? God's saying, okay, I'm going to bring another nation in to punish the evil in your nation, right? Habakkuk responding, why are you letting wicked people do your bidding? God's response is, well, I punish all wickedness. He does it in different ways. He might use the wicked to punish the wicked, but then he'll punish the first wicked after that. Those who do evil those who mistreat others, those who build gain on unjust acts, those who hide themselves away to escape consequences for their actions, those who shame others, all of that will be brought back on them because God cares for his people who follow him. He punishes the wicked to protect the righteous. And if you feel like someone is taking advantage of you, or your life is a mess because of what other people have done, take heart. Because it may feel like they have won the battle. But truly, they have lost the world, the war. God will not let evil win in the end. Trust him. Because the righteous shall live by faith. Let's bow as we close in prayer. And as we close in prayer, I'd like to invite the person who's going to be leading communion and offering and Amy to lead special music to come on up. God, thank you so much for this time that you have given us. Thank you for this reminder that evil does not win in the end. That even though it may feel like wickedness is running rampant, that you will handle it. That you will take care of us, that you will bring justice. Comfort us in that fact. Help us to look to you and our struggles. We pray this in your name. Amen.